Well, once again, welcome to Foundation Church. My name is John, I'm the pastor here, and I'm so honored that you're worshiping with us either in person or online. I'm gonna make this plea one last time. I would just love it if you take a moment, if you haven't already, and go ahead and like and share this service so all of your friends and family not only get to hear the good news that you're about to hear, but they get to hear this epic failure story that I'm gonna share with you in just a second. So look, today we're beginning a brand new series called Relationally Charged. This is a series that's gonna offer some practical and biblically-based tips for how you can improve your relationships with people in your lives. This is built around the idea that all of us have relationships. All of us need relationships. As a matter of fact, all of us are charged by those relationships. So today we're gonna be talking about our friends and our family. And this should be perhaps the easiest one because this, these are the people who we've known the longest, we know the best, they're our friends or our relatives. But this is a place where we often mess up and just so you don't feel bad, I'm gonna share with you a time when I really epically messed up as a friend in just a moment. But first I wanna to read to you the scripture passage that we're gonna be using. We're gonna be using John's gospel and I'm gonna be reading from John chapter 15, verses 12 to 17. Uh, this is Jesus talking to his followers. Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. This is God's word is given freely to each and every one of you. Now to the epic failure. In order to get into that, I think I have to start with an easy question, a simple question, and this question is, do you like to go out to eat. Now, put COVID aside, maybe you're, you don't like to go out to eat now, but do you like to go out to eat if, if health wasn't a concern? Uh, if you're in person, go ahead and raise your hand. If you do online, I want you to comment yes. Online, folks, go ahead. If, if the answer is yes for you, tell me your favorite restaurant. I, I need some new restaurants. So here's the thing. I like to go out to eat. I still like to go out to eat. I don't care. Uh, I, I'm that guy, right? But don't think less of me. My taste in food is like really predictable and really lame and static. And so for me going out to eat, like if I had anywhere and I could choose anywhere, it's often gonna look like a hamburger and it's often gonna look like fast food. I know it's terrible, right? I didn't, I didn't get this physique for nothing. Uh, so, so I do like to go out to eat, but I just love like a fast food hamburger. So here's the thing, I have two friends. So my oldest friends in life, friends who I've known since we were both children or we were all children. And these friends and I get together almost weekly to have a meal. And we've been doing this for years and years and we get together, here's the problem. While I like, like Burger King, one of my friends likes very unique and like authentic food. Is that a good way? Is that a nice way to put it, authentic food? Yeah, this, this friend wouldn't be caught dead at McDonald's. So often we go where this person wants to go, which is more unique, and maybe you would say nicer eating establishments. Here's the problem. We got together a few years ago now at a particularly unique and authentic establishment that was in a home, in a residence. And I was in a particularly good mood, and by good I mean terrible. And it was toward the end of the month, and my family does this thing with envelopes where I get my money for the month in an envelope, which means I was almost out of money. And this authentic restaurant maybe cost a little more than like the dollar soda at McDonald's would have cost me. And so I showed up and all I could think was this place is too expensive and this food is too unique and too authentic and this setting is too weird. And so I ordered myself a water and I sat there something like this. No? Nobody thinks that's funny? See, the, my two friends were super gut about it. They were like, what's wrong, buddy? Are you okay? As I 
proceeded to throw like a little pouty fit. I mean, I was like seconds away from falling on the ground and pounding my fists and my feet. And here's the problem, is it wasn't that the food was too expensive or that the restaurant was too unique, the food was too weird for me. It was really that I was being too selfish. Too selfish. Because here's the thing that I want you to remember if you remember nothing else about today. It's not about you. If only somebody had said that to me that day in that, we probably would have fought, actually. We're that kind of friends. We probably would have gone outside and thrown fisticuffs. But if only I had heard myself say, John, it's not about you. See, that's the message for today. It's not about you. When you're trying to show love to your friends and your family, the thing to remember, it's not about you. So let's go to that passage again, that John 15, verses 12 to 17. I'm going to highlight a couple verses and a few words within that I think are going to help us better understand this. But let me give you a little bit of context. So Jesus is talking. He's talking to his followers. It's likely that it's not just 12. It's not just the 12 disciples, but probably a larger group of followers. The other thing that's important to understand is Jesus is preparing them for his imminent death. He is going to be leaving, and so he is giving them final instructions. What this means, or what we can take from this, is this is probably, in Jesus' opinion, some of the most important stuff he can be saying to his followers. So let's look at verse 12. In verse 12, Jesus says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now, he actually starts and ends this passage with this command to love one another, he bookends his teaching, his final bit of teaching to his followers with loving one another. But I want to highlight that word love because in English we have one word for love, love. But in Greek they have like a hundred or maybe five. Your Bible uses three. Uh, there are like love, love of proximity, like I'm near you so I love you because we're close to each other. Love of, of like feelings, like I'm in love with you, I feel love toward you. And then there's this word that Jesus uses. This is a love of choice. It means I choose to love you. It's not because I feel it, it's not because it's easy or convenient, like we're close to one another, but I choose to love you. And it's really important to understand that, that sometimes when we're loving our family and our friends especially, it's a conscious choice. You're not always feeling it when your children are misbehaving. You're not always feeling it when your parents are getting on your back, and you're certainly not always feeling it when your hoity-toity friend makes you go to some fancy restaurant and you don't have enough money to pay for anything, right? So you have to choose this love. The other word that I want to highlight is the word command. Jesus uses this word, and it sounds strong. But the word is a word that focuses on the end result, not the means. It's all about the what, not the how. In other words, Jesus is saying, I don't care how you love each other. I just care that you love each other. And what this brings to mind is this idea that we show love for one another in wildly different and sometimes, dare I say, weird ways. As a matter of fact, this is a question just for the people online. The question for the online folks is, what is the weirdest way you have ever shown love for someone? Please keep it appropriate. So, look, weirdest way, let me give you an example. In my circle of friends, when we were early on getting married, we had this tradition where we would show love for the newly married couple by taking the gifts from their reception while they were off on their honeymoon and delivering them to their house. That sounds nice, right? And then we would destroy their home, just trash it, prank them in the meanest way possible, like, you know, like taking saran wrap and saran wrapping all their furniture to their bed. So when they got home from their honeymoon, they couldn't get in bed. Or mixing up all their spices labels. Or taping their refrigerator shut. This is a tradition that ended right after I got married. Actually, right before, because it never happened to me. I, maybe it's because my friends don't love me that much. Now, whenever I tell this story, people give the same looks that all of you are giving. You are a monster, and I'm so glad I'm not your friend. Let me be clear, though. This was the most loving thing we could think of to do for one another, and we did it for more than a few of our friends uh, to let them know we love them. It, it often also included breaking into the home because after the first friend, nobody's given anybody the keys, right? So you gotta find a way to get in. Uh, at any rate, that's the weirdest way I think I've ever shown love. Go ahead and comment down below if you haven't already. Weirdest way you've shown love. Let's move on to verse 13 because Jesus doesn't stop with the command to love each other. 
In verse 13, he says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's own life for their friends. Now, this is Jesus foreshadowing what he's about to do. This is him planting a seed for his followers, not only in the moment, but yes, us as well, 2,000 years later, saying, friends, I love you this much. I'm willing to die for you. This is heavy stuff. This is life and death. And he's saying this is the greatest love we can show. Now, if we move on to verse 16. In verse 16, he reminds those who are called by him, those who follow him, which again, I'm going to suggest includes you. He reminds them, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, for those first 12, it was obvious. He went to them and said, follow me. 2,000 years later, though, Christians still say that we can't follow God if God doesn't first extend grace to us. That if God doesn't first choose us, that we can't follow him effectively or well. We can't do it on our own. And so if you are here, if you are seeking after God, if you are actively following God, I want to suggest to you that God chose you. And that word chose, choose, or choice is really important. That word has this sense of intentional choosing. Like it's not an accident. It's not just walking down a crowd and grabbing anyone who will come. But it also has a sense of a real purpose, that there's some end in mind, some reason why you, specifically each one of you, was chosen. And so when Jesus is saying this to us, to his followers, this has incredible meaning. Now, it's at this point that I know some of you are saying, Jesus chose me, like specifically chose me for a purpose. And of course, then you naturally are asking the question, what is my purpose? But again, I have to say really clearly to all of you, it is not about you. Stop thinking about yourself. That's supposed to be funny. It wasn't that funny. Give me like a pity laugh. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So it's, it's not about you because today we're talking about friends and family. We're talking about the relationship we have with our friends and family. But I'm going to suggest to you that part of your purpose for sure is to love your friends and your family. So let's talk a little bit more about that. We're talking about love and command and choice. But in verse 13, I think Jesus gives us our best tip. So we're going to go back to that. Verse 13. In verse 13, this is where he's foreshadowing his own death, but I don't think that this only has to be talking about life and death. For some of us, I think the test of true love, truly caring for a person is saying, I would be willing to die for them. But the reality is that all of us will die once. So I guess all of us have one opportunity to die for someone. But the reality is that we can figuratively lay down our lives every moment of every day until we die, which gives us almost limitless opportunities to love our friends and our families, those who mean the most to us, to show them that we love them by laying down our lives, not in a very literal sense, but a figurative one, right? All of a sudden, now you have tons of chances to show people how much you love them through the little things. Right, here's the thing about love, and this is, this is free of charge for me. Different people hear and express love differently. So for instance, some people, love is all about words. You have to say it for them to hear it. For others, love is about actions. Talk is cheap. You have to show them with what you do. For others, yet yeah, love is about touch. They need a hug or they need you to hold their hand to let them know that you really love them. For others, yet yeah, it's gifts. If you give them a gift, they know you really love them. There's this great book talking about this. It's called Love Languages. It ex expounds and expands upon this idea. Uh, this is to set up an example of this in my life. Let me show you a, a really simple a little example of this idea of loving people, not just ultimately, but in the everyday, in ways that are meaningful to them. So when I was 15 years old, I still had this idea that I was a tough guy. Yeah, I know it's hard to believe because I'm so clearly not a tough guy now. I have these like soft hands. I'm a pastor. But at 15, I was a football player and a wrestler and I thought I was tough. I was also becoming a man. And what that meant was I didn't do soft, sappy things like hug my mother in public. Not ever because I was a tough guy. 
And so I remember this would really upset my mom because it seems as though her love language, the way I could best express to her that I loved her was to hug her in front of an audience. Like the bigger the crowd, the more I loved her. And the fact that I wouldn't hug her in front of any human being meant that I didn't love her at all. But I was like, I got a reputation to uphold. Like I'm a tough guy, I can't do this. I know right now there are some parents who are nudging their teenage children. I know there are some teenagers who are cringing because their parents are hearing this. My father pulled me aside and my dad was one of the toughest guys I know. He pulled me aside and he said, John, I really need you to hug your mother, not just at home, but like in front of people. It really is breaking her heart that you won't hug her in front of the guys. And I said, dad, hugging her in front of the guys is the worst possible scenario. They will pick on me and they will know I'm not a tough guy. And my father looked at me straight in the face and he said, son, I don't want to ruin this for you, but you are not a tough guy. <laughs> you are not as tough as you think you are. And I need you to hug your mother in front of people. Now that was hard to hear. A, because I was pretty convinced I was a tough guy, but B, because that meant I was going to get picked on. But I did that. I hugged my mother, it was painful, it hurt, people were mean, no, it's not really that bad. It wasn't bad at all. Uh, but I did that to communicate to her, again, to lay down my life in a figurative way, on a routine basis, to communicate to her that I loved her. That's what we're talking about. When we're talking about loving your friends and your family, we're talking about finding those little opportunities that are most meaningful, to those people that you love and care about and communicate to them that you love them. This will enhance your relationship. This will relationally charge you and them. This will kick things up a notch. Now look, today we have focused on our friends and our family. The relationships in theory that you've had the longest, the people that you know the best and who know you the best, it should be the easiest. And yet, sometimes we epically mess up in these relationships because these are also often people we are around the most. They see the best and, sadly, the worst of us. With that in mind, Jesus has commanded us, commanded us to love each other. Not how we're supposed to love one another, again, remember, but that we do it. But ultimately, you have a choice. You can choose to do that or you can choose not to. And so I want to end with this final question. In person, I want to see your hands online. I want to see your comments. That question is, will you choose to lay down your life this week for those you love? How many of you will do that? How many of you will join me this week in laying down your life for those you love? Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer. God, you loved us first. You loved us when we were unlovable. You loved us to the point of being willing to die for us. And yet you also called us, commanded us to love one another, to show that same love, not in the big ways only, but daily in the small ways. Lord, help us to continue to grow in those ways, to express that love in ways that others will hear and receive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.